Uh, without further ado, John, thank you. Thanks for being here. Welcome. Thank you, Mark, for that terrific introduction. That and uh, five bucks will give me a cup of coffee at Starbucks, <laughs> I think. Um, and thank you all for being here this evening. Um, I should probably explain a couple of things before we get started. Uh, first of all, I am a scientist by education. I didn't start out to get into history. In fact, I can't name a history teacher I had. I can name one in high school only because he was particularly bad. Um, but I fell into it. Uh, over a 20 year period working at First Castle. And I take some comfort in the fact that one of the most influential figures in the 19th century, in all aspects of life in the 19th century, um, said, anything I ever learned of any value, I taught myself. That was Charles Darwin. So I have said about, over the last uh, 35 years, actually a little more than 35 years, trying to educate myself on what we call America's Gilded Age. And uh, as a scientist, I should explain that in, as a biologist, there are really two kinds of biologists when it comes to systematics. There are what are called lumpers and there are splitters. Splitters tend to live in the details and think every detail is as important as the other. And lumpers tend to step back on things and try to find the connections. And I'm def definitely from the lumper camp of biologists. And so that's what I try to do with history as well. I try to look at the context because I think the most interesting things to be learned are in the context, not in the facts and details particularly. The facts and details are important. I don't mean to, to undermine them or to um, say they're not important, but it's the bigger picture, I think, that is the most interesting and the most engaging. And that's what we're going to try to look at tonight. We're going to look at uh, not the, the how and the where and the when and the who of the Florida East Coast Railway or the Overseas Railroad, but I want to look at the why and the what, because those questions have really not been addressed. They weren't addressed in Flagler's lifetime. They really haven't been addressed since, and I think they're the most interesting. So <laughs> that's the, the thrust of tonight's lecture. Of course, we'll start with why. Um, sort of the obvious question, why would Henry Flagler build the Overseas Railroad? And it's a much more complicated question than people would assume. I mean, the, the standard answer is that he found they were going to build the Panama Canal, and gee, a railhead in Key West would be a wonderful thing to have, since it would be the nearest American port, or railhead, I should say, to the canal when it was finished. But it's much more complicated than that. So. Let's start with talking about what would motivate Henry Flagler. This is a photograph of Henry Flagler in 1904, just before he announced that he was going to build the Overseas Railroad. But, it's a, but really what had been going on throughout his entire life is what shaped his view on whether he was going to build the Overseas Railroad or not. And as we'll see, the story goes much further back in time than his announcement in 1905. I, I wanted to show you this because it it's a, it's a, helps us understand uh, what, it was, what the thinking was like, what the gestalt of the 19th century uh, titans of industry and business was. Uh, so this is a, an 1878 railway system, proposed railway system, with its center at St. Paul. And what I want you to notice is a double track bridge across the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> they call it the St. Paul and London Intercontinental Double Track Railway. <laughs> And, you know, I, this, I think this is what's missing from what was missing from the latter half of the 20th century. I hope we'll come back in the 21st century. Is this sort of willingness to think of things in a really big way? It was so prevalent in the 19th century among Americans. Now, the fact that they could think this way made other things possible. If you don't think big to begin with, it's uh, it's not likely you'll accomplish big things. But if you think big to begin with it's possible you'll accomplish at least some of those big things, and that's certainly what happened in the 19th century. And I want to show you this graphic, too. This is from the back of a series of novelettes that Henry Flagler published in 1903. Um, he had novelettes written for each of his hotels, for seven of them anyway, and they were cute little stories of activities that guests could engage in at the hotel. So it was a way of highlighting what you could do if you were a guest at one of those hotels, each hotel being a little bit different. 
What I like about it, though, is it tells us a lot about Henry Flagler's view of the world. I mean, look at this thing. We've got the sun shining down. The whole hemisphere is taken up by Florida, Cuba, and the Bahamas, right? And the sun is shining down on it and blowing a hole out the other side of the earth. Um, it's another example of the big thinking. You know, the, this, in this case, it's a, an example of Henry Flagler's big thinking and his view of the world. We like to talk about Henry Flagler, uh, and most books have been written sort of along the lines that he sort of stumbled his way from St. Augustine to Key West. Uh, but in fact, within a very short time of his arrival in St. Augustine, he was thinking about what he came to call his domain, as what you see on this graphic illustration, as the Bahamas, Florida, and Cuba. So really big thinking. But he knew if he was going to be successful, he needed to play his cards close to his vest. So he didn't make public his view particularly, although it did sneak out in graphics like this. Uh, and we do have plenty of evidence to support um, the, the perspective that's illustrated in this graphic. So of course, Key West, you know, one of the folklore, one of the sort of myths about Key West is that it was the largest city in Florida and that it was the wealthiest city in the United States. And I've been guilty of repeating that uh, myth myself many times. But in fact, the 1910 census showed that it had a population of 20,000, which was pretty darn large for 1910, but only about two-thirds as large as Jacksonville. So it was not the largest city in Florida, nor was it the wealthiest. If you try to do a little research on what the wealthiest per capita city in the country was, you'll find that there are at least 100 cities claiming that distinction, but very little evidence to back it up. At least I haven't been able to find it so far. Nevertheless, it was a big city. Key West had been clamoring for a railroad since railroads since the 1830s. So, in fact, Flagler being born in 1830, excuse me, um, if had he been a citizen of Florida this, in his entire life, he would have been aware of the interest that Key West citizens had in bringing a railroad to Key West. Railroads were everything in the 19th century. They were the highest form of technology. They were the largest corporations. They were, the mean, they were the source of wealth for most of the titans of the 19th century. So certainly they were interested. And the Navy had a huge base there as well. I wanted you to see this map just so you get some sense of the proximity of things in the world. Uh, and you can see Cuba is very close to Florida. So naturally with the, it's understandable that Flagler might want to include it in his thinking and domain. But it also shows you the relative distance from the canal, from the isthmus, where the canal would eventually be built and its proximity to both Cuba and Florida. And of course, until there was a canal, the way to get around, or the way to get from the Atlantic to the Pacific would be, by ship anyway, would be go around the, the Cape Horn. And I love this photograph because it shows a, a square rigger going around the horn, and these guys are up shortening sail. Can you imagine being in a, a you can see in the background what kind of storm this was. Can you imagine being in that kind of storm crawling up into the rigging to shorten sail? Um, it took, th this is when sailors were real men, uh, and, and uh, I, I got to imagine that more than a few were lost in this kind of endeavor. So it was a very expensive, very long process. Um, it was 15,000 nautical miles to get from California uh, to the east coast around the Horn. But because of the California gold rush and other, uh, other things going on, by 1910, roughly, um, $1.5 billion in gold was coming around the horn. So not only was this risky for the sailors, it was risky for investors. If, you're, if you're a million and a half dollar shipment wasn't unusual back then, um, if that went to the bottom, probably so did your, your career in business. By the way, that's equivalent today to roughly $35 billion of gold going around the horn uh, each year. So there was some potential there if you could save people the trouble, right? Um, Key West was also interesting because back when we got away from square riggers and went to steamships, they were fired by coal. And this is a coaling station in Key West. If you could get the coal there more efficiently by rail, there was a, an opportunity to be taken advantage of as well. So another attractive feature of building a railroad to Key West. Other things that Flagler was thinking about at the time were, of course, the Spanish-American War which was staged out of Tampa, much to Flagler's dismay. He was very disappointed that the war was staged out of Tampa rather than West Palm Beach or Miami or someplace within his domain. 
This is a picture, of course, of the Rough Riders and Teddy Roosevelt at the center. The Rough Riders, by the way, was a name he adopted from the Columbian Exposition. They had a World Congress of Rough Riders at Buffalo Bill and his pals started, and uh, T.R. thought it would be fun to sort of shorten that name and adopt it for his group of soldiers. Well, here's a Cuban railway stock. I want to show you this because Flagler had a direct interest in Cuba that very few people are aware of. He owned $250,000 in Cuban railway stock. Why would he do that? Well, Cuba was much more attractive in the 19th century than it has become in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. And easy to get to. I mean, after all, look, look at the proximity again. Um, and it was a favorite place for a lot of Americans to spend time in a very well-developed uh, place, especially in Havana. But there are other interests in Cuba as well. I mean, not only did he have a real interest in the railway system in the city of Havana and all it represented, but people like Milton Hershey uh, had invested, invested in Cuba. He found that, that Cuba was a great place for him to grow sugar cane for his chocolate uh, production. And so he had established a chocolate, I should say, a sugar mill, <coughs> a number of sugar mills and plantations in Cuba to uh, provide the sugar he needed for his operation. And of course, I mentioned Cuba was a well-developed, especially Havana, a well-developed society in the late 19th century. This is just an example of one of the buildings in Cuba have to be a railway terminal to give you a sense that they, that they had Europeans, uh, they had uh, aspirations on a, on a level uh, with Europeans and Americans and their architecture and their uh, culture uh, in the 19th century. And the last but not least, Henry Flagler was interested in Key West because he hoped eventually to develop a ferry system that would take not just passengers but entire passenger railway cars to Cuba. And that happened, actually. Uh, of course, I'm not giving away anything. You all know he completed the Overseas Railroad, but this part you may not know about. He, in 1914, the year after his death, the first ferry system for the Florida East Coast Railway began operating, which allowed them, and if you look closely, you can see tracks at the back end of this ship, allowed them to roll, them being the Florida East Coast Railway, to roll the entire passenger cars off the tracks onto the ship with the passengers still in their seats, they could arrive in Cuba, be rolled off the same way at the other end, and start, start rolling around the Cuban railway system, which Flagler was a, uh, an investor in. Truly amazing to think about. So you could get in New York, you could get in your private car in New York, or a regular passenger car in New York, and 48 hours later you could be in Havana. That was the height of luxury back then. None of us would put up a 48 hours today. You know, if it's more for, for the four or five hours, maybe we start to get kind of antsy, but for them, that was, that was real luxury. So Flagler was thinking very early on, I mentioned, of probably in the 1880s. So remember he built the Hotel Ponce de Leon in St. Augustine was open in 1888. I would be willing to wager, though, we haven't come through all of the tens of thousands of documents we have in our archives. But I would be, and, and we certainly don't have everything that there is, but I would be willing to wager that it wouldn't be surprising to find evidence that Flagler was thinking about Key West even before he left St. Augustine, because in 1891, he met with a state senator who represented Key West, and he was also the head of the state senate, so the equivalent of Jeff Atwater today. He met with him, his name was Jefferson Brown, by the way. He met with him, of all places, at the Tampa Bay Hotel in Tampa. This was 1891, he met with him, and what did he want to discuss? He wanted to discuss whether the state senate or the legislature in general would be willing to let all the other charters they had issued for building a railroad to Key West lapse and issue one to Henry Flagler that would be the sole charter to build a railroad to Key West. And Jefferson Brown was willing to listen because he believed Henry Flagler was the only one with the means and the determination and the will to build that kind of railroad. And that's exactly what happened ultimately. So, Let's talk a little bit about um, the canal, because of course the canal was a big part of Flagler's decision as well, and um, something that had been on his mind his entire life. Uh, we think of the canal as something that happened in the late 19th century, and in fact it did when the Americans took over the project from the French, we were able, able to successfully complete the canal. But in fact the idea of the canal goes clear back to Carlos I of Spain, when Balboa sort of did a little investigating and mapping of the area. 
he reported that there was an isthmus and that there might be a possibility of uh, digging a, a canal between the two oceans. So he reported, this is of course Balboa on the left, Carlos I of Spain on the right. He reported back to Carlos I who thought it would be a grand idea to build a canal because even then they were thinking about saving the, the trip around, the, around Cape Horn. Of course not much came of it because the maps were very poor, the technology wasn't up to, to, to the task, uh, but it was certainly talked about. And so you can see that if this is 1513, and Flagler finishes in 1912, if this is not a new idea, it's been around 400 years the time actually is uh, accomplished. This is Alexander von Humboldt, who in 1804 explored nine possible sites for, an, for a canal across the Isthmus. So even before Flagler was born, people were seriously trying to figure out how to build a canal across the Isthmus. By the way, Humboldt discovered a, a lot of things, including electric eels, the first electric eel he found nearly electrocuted him to death. Um, but he did survive, and we all, I think we all know from our basic geology classes that the Humboldt current running up the coast of Chile, a cold current, is an important part of the ecosystem. Maybe we don't all know that. I knew that as a biologist. One of the solutions was to build a railroad uh, across the isthmus, and that worked for quite a while. This is a picture of the Panama Railway built in 1884. So a ship could come down the west coast or the east coast, link up in Panama, offload the goods onto the railway, and cross the, the isthmus, unload the goods to the ship. Still sort of an expensive process. This is a 440 engine, same kind of engine Flagler ran on some of his tracks early on before East Coast Railway. When Flagler announced that he was going to build the railroad, Elijah Root, our Secretary of State at the time, declared it was uh, more of more strategic importance to the U.S. than just than anything else except the canal. That's how gung ho the government was about uh, building the Overseas Railroad. So, as we know, the U.S. took over the project of building the canal, and I want to show you just a couple of shots to give you some sense of the magnitude of that project. And by the way, we all know about Gustav Eiffel because he built what? The Eiffel Tower, and we know maybe about him because he built the infrastructure that holds up the Statue of Liberty. But he also was contracted when this was a French project to design the lock gates, which are just magnificent gates uh, for the canal. But of course, the French went belly up uh, after several <coughs> courses of investments that they finally had to, they finally collapsed, leaving the shareholders with nothing. And by the way, I picked up a Panama Canal certificate uh, Paris a couple years ago from an old document store. They don't think anything of it, so I think it cost me, what, um, six euros, maybe? <laughs> six euros. I thought it was a great thing to have. You're taking questions after? Or I'll take questions afterward, okay. if that's okay. Or if you think you can't remember until later, I, I know I have that problem. You can dive right in. <laughs> um, so here's a, here's a great picture of one of the cuts in the, in the Panama Canal. You can imagine taking out that valley of dirt, which is what we had to do, in order to make the canal possible. So there's a little bit about the why. There's a lot Flagler had to consider. There was a lot he'd been thinking about his entire life. That in fact, the whole world had been thinking about for some time, and uh, America had been thinking about some time. So not a new idea, um, and one um, that had a lot of uh, a lot of factors to it. So now let's talk a little bit about the what. And I'm, here I want to talk about the, what was the political environment like, what was the economic environment like, and what was the labor environment like. Because these were all of great concern to anybody who's going to take on a project that ended up costing many tens of millions of dollars to complete. There's a lot at stake here. Um, one of the things he had to consider was just the fact that there was a lot of turmoil in this country. We think of America as relatively peaceful, but I can assure you that 100 years ago, we were anything but a peaceful country. Um, domestic ter terrorism was uh, at a level that none of us could imagine today. Um, Flagler, for example, in his lifetime saw three American presidents assassinated. First, James Garfield in 1881 by a madman, who was the second of three. Of course, he saw he, Lincoln, he knew about Lincoln's assassination, which um, uh, happened at the very beginning of the Gilded Age. Um, he also knew about William McKinley being assassinated in 1901 by an anarchist. An anarchist and um, socialists were, formed a, a significant part of the 
the society, of American society, at the turn of the 20th century, uh, and were uh, in league with the labor movement at the time. So the labor movement sometimes took advantage of the anarchists who were happy to bomb just about anything because they had bit bombs they wanted planted, and the socialists sometimes do the same. And so certainly the socialists were part of the labor unions as well. And our society was moving away from an agrarian society. So a huge part of our population moved off the farm and into the cities. And that meant a big shift in our economy and how we did things. So a very difficult time economically. Actually, uh, uh, McKinley was visiting the Pan American Exposition when he was shot. Uh, the lead architects for that exposition were Carrere and Hastings, uh, the architects who designed Whitehall and the New York Public Library, and the Frick Collection, and the House and Senate buildings in Washington, and many, of other, many other public buildings. Well, with McKinley's assassination, his vice president suddenly becomes president. We all recognize this guy, and I love this picture. I'm sure it's just because he had very bad eyesight. I don't think he's really trying to scare anybody on the other side of the camera. Um, but TR became president, and TR had ambitions that he could finally realize. Remember. He'd been a big part of the Spanish-American War, at least he thought he was. He'd also been Secretary of the Navy and was a big proponent of the big, the great white fleet making America a naval power because he believed that was essential if we were ever going to be a world force. And so Teddy was the kind of guy who was willing to, he, while he might have campaigned against trusts, the large corporations that were becoming an important part of the, uh, the economy, um, the rules he wanted them to follow were not the rules he felt he should follow. So he was more than happy, for example, to support those who wanted to break off from Colombia and create their own new country called Panama because it would serve the interests of the United States who wanted to build a canal. Uh, I love this cartoon because this is the kind of fight it was between Colombia and America, or Teddy <laughs> and Colombia. Uh, it wasn't a fair fight, right? Uh, not at all. And so we essentially took Panama away from the Colombians so that we would have uh, control of the site where the canal would be built. In fact, I love this political cartoon too. This is a big stick in the Caribbean. This is Teddy with the white fleet going around the Caribbean, sort of letting everybody know who's in charge now of this part of the world. Uh, in fact, it was at this time that America, fought as a part of the Spanish-American Spanish War, Became, uh, took on five new territories. We took on not just Cuba, but we took on the Philippines as a consequence of the war. We took on Puerto Rico as a consequence of the war. And we took on Guam. And on the other side of the world, we took on Hawaii. All around 1898 to 1900, we all suddenly were this, this power that had some influence across the oceans of the world. And that great white navy was how we could hold on to those far flung. Uh, possessions. Of course, that's not how Americans saw it. This is how Americans saw it. Liberty was heralding peace to the world, to the natives of Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. In this particular cartoon, and Uncle Sam is in the back, rocked back with the eagle sitting next to him, uh, smoking his pipe. Uh, of course, <laughs> Taking on those far-flung territories was no easy matter, and I love this cartoon because we have a classroom with Uncle Sam, who's whopping a couple of kids who are fighting uh, with a stick. Over in the right-hand corner, you can see Hawaii and Puerto Rico, who are the well-behaved students in our <laughs> classroom. They didn't cause any trouble. Um, the uh, gentleman with the dunce hat is a was a, uh, a rebel in. Uh, the Philippines, who fought against the Spanish and then fought against us when we became, uh, when, when it became part of the U.S. territory, and it's it's basically Cuba. The two kids in the middle are Cubans fighting with each other, essentially. So, Flagler, by the way, as you probably could guess, didn't much like T.R. He didn't like T.R. at all. In fact, he said, "I have no words to express how much I don't like him," um, because he felt that T.R. had like his cousin would later do, FDR, had set the Attorney General on, a, on the specific tasks to bring down certain corporations. So in the same way that FDR went after Andrew Mellon, who had been our treasurer through several presidencies for tax evasion, which of course he was found innocent of, um, 
he went after TRV. He went after Standard Oil and other large corporations. Uh, so I've always thought it was interesting that it was TR who changed the name of the, the executive mansion to the White House in 1901, just as Flagler decided he was building his house and they're going to name it Whitehall in 1901. Um, I haven't found any hard evidence to support my theory, but I don't think there's, I don't think that's a coincidence. That's how focused Henry Flagler was on TR. TR was probably just focused on Standard Oil for the most part, not Flagler in particular. So that gives you a sense maybe of the political environment. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the political environment and the anarchy and how it affected things when we talk about labor. But suffice it to say that if we were alive 100 years ago, we would probably think that we're having a sort of Timothy McVeigh experience about every other week in America. Bombings were that frequent across the nation back in those days. And assassination attempts were almost as frequent for major figures, major political figures, and corporate heads. So let's talk about the economic environment. What was it like uh, at this time? And I love this cartoon just because it, uh, it it's sort of the standard view of capitalism, I think, and sort of the Darwinian view uh, as it was understood in the 19th century of capitalism. We didn't call them recessions back in the 19th century. We called them what? Panics, which I think is a much more accurate term for what happens. We lose confidence in the markets and we pull our money out and it causes a panic because we're panicked. And that's what they were called back then. The first one that Flagler encountered as a businessman, really, as a, as a serious businessman, was the Panic of 1873, when they thought all was lost. Uh, he and a, a young fellow named John D. Rockefeller just put together a corporation they called Standard Oil uh, at, in 1870. So they were in the midst of trying to get their little business going when they were selling kerosene out of carts like this before they became a really big corporation. And that panic was a serious matter for them because it really disrupts cash flow. Um, turns out, though, historians have gone back to the 1870s and said, wait a minute, it might have seemed like a panic to everybody. Certainly incomes went down, but the cost of living went down even more so that the standard of living actually went up in the 1870s. So it may be the only American panic or recession where things got better and people were just more scared. Um, of course, standard oil went on to become the largest corporation in the world and the most profitable corporation in the world from that little wagon type of business you saw a second ago. And this is the building, the picture of the building, of the Standard Oil building in uh, New York, which Carrera and Hastings heavily reconfigured for Standard Oil so that we're looking at the, the uh, configuration that's the result of Carrera and Hastings. Um, 1873 is also the year that, by the way, uh, Mark Twain wrote a book called The Gilded Age. That was his term for the period. And it's a term that we apply to the period still. Um, of course, another panic came along in 1893 uh, when people were cashing in silver notes for gold because there was a fixed relationship between them. And the gold, gold reserves dramatically fell and they started to fall worldwide. And so this cartoon shows how, how we blame the Rothschilds we always blame bankers for panics, by the way. Um, there's nobody else to blame, so they get blamed. The Rothschilds, in this case, in London, were being blamed for the panic of 1893. And this one, again, affected Henry Flagler because he was in the midst of building the Hotel Royal Poinciana and establishing Palm Beach. The hotel became the largest resort in the world uh, when it was completed. And, uh, and the fact that he could lure people from New York to this middle of the nowhere, I mean, this is a beautiful picture, but the rest of Palm Beach where there really was the middle of nowhere in 1894, he could lure them from New York is just amazing. 1,150 rooms, a dining room that would seat 1,600 people. Uh, it was truly a grand hotel. But to finish the construction, he had to borrow money. Rather than sell Standard Oil stock, he would borrow money if he could. Now, his credit was so good and his stock was so valuable that he didn't have trouble borrowing the money, he might have had to pay a little more interest, but he didn't have trouble borrowing the money. And so he could complete the, the Hotel Royal Poinciana. And the third great panic or recession came along in 1907. Um, by then, uh, J.P. Morgan and his network of boards of directors of corporations 
had tried in lieu of a federal bank, a national bank, to stabilize our, stabilize our economy by having interlocking boards and by consolidating corporations to, to sort of control the supply in hopes that that would eliminate the panics. And of course, it was J.P. Morgan who stepped in in 1907 when there was no Federal Reserve, got his banker friends together, locked him in his office in his library in New York, and said, we're going to figure this out. So I need this money, this, this much money from you, I need this much money from you, and we're going to make this work. And they kept the government afloat. They saved us from the Panic of 1907, which, by the way, a lot of its source came from something called derivatives uh, that were sold through bucket shops. And they were outlawed as a result of the Panic of 1907 and stayed uh, illegal until the Clinton administration in 2000 passed something called the Commodity Futures Modernization Act. I think we didn't read our history very well. Of course, Greenspan encouraged them to pass that, thinking the markets were self-regulating by then. But in fact, uh, the markets aren't self-regulating. So we are now experiencing a panic or a recession as a consequence of derivative financial of, uh, devices again. Of course, that panic meant that the cash flow dried up again. And Henry Flagler, again, while he had lots of Standard Oil stock he could sell, he preferred not to. So he floated <coughs> temporary gold bonds, uh, basically a mortgage against the Florida East Coast Railway. And this one is number one. It's in the museum's collection. We were lucky to acquire it years ago. It's for a million dollars. It's signed by J.P. Morgan Jr., Jake, J.P. Morgan's son. Uh, and it promises to pay 4.5% interest and to have the total paid within a 50-year period in gold. So it's a pretty amazing financial document. But this is how he was able to fund or provide the cash flow he needed to build uh, the last part, the hardest part of the OC Railroad. So as you can see, finances and the economy were constantly affecting Flagler's projects. The difference between Henry Flagler and many others was, I think, and many and people of today, I should say, because others were doing the same thing like Flagler, is that they believed that, that these were temporary disruptions to cash flow and that they should press on the opportunity existed now to do these things. And it didn't slow them down in building this in Standard Oil. It didn't slow them down in building the Hotel Royal Poinciana. And it didn't slow them down in building uh, the Oversea Railroad. It wasn't until 1913 that a Federal Reserve was finally formed. We'd had two national banks before this, uh, but Jefferson hated banks. He wanted to be a gentleman farmer, so he killed the central bank. And Jackson hated banks because he thought he was a gentleman farmer besides being a soldier, and so he killed the national bank. And it was finally under the Wilson administration that we created a Federal Reserve to control the flow of money and help to stem the impact of panics. And uh, I, I would argue whether we Believe it or not, uh, this panic, this recession we're living through today was mitigated to some extent because we didn't tighten up the money flow like we did in 1907 during the Great Depression and earlier panics because we had a Federal Reserve. All right, so let's talk about the labor environment. What was that like? And I love this cartoon because it shows a, a capitalist pyramid with labor being the foundation of capitalism. And then as we go up, the more and more privileged uh, exist on different levels. But what's missing, this, by the way, every, almost every cartoon I show you is, by, is inherently biased because it's a lot easier to sell newspapers and magazines to the 99% than to the 1%. You make more money selling newspapers and magazines to the 99% than the 1%. So it's very hard to find cartoons in favor of capital uh, or investors or anything like that. So what's missing from this cartoon or this pyramid is risk and capital, which are necessary in the capitalist world to make things happen. Somebody has to put up the capital and somebody has to take the risk, but they're not a part of this pyramid. It's strictly about labor holding everything up. And that's the view of the world that prevailed in, in Flagler's lifetime and still prevails today. This next cartoon uh, shows justice with one blind uh, well, one eye open because she's not really handing out even-handed justice. She's killing anarchy. We knew anarchy was a threat. And that's the scorpion to the right. But she's ignoring the octopus behind, which represents the trusts. So it's steel and land and oil trusts that are taking over the country. But again, we're shifting from an agrarian society to a capitalist 
industrial-based society, and it's it's a it's a difficult shift, a very difficult shift, um, but it raised the standard of living for everyone ultimately, and gave us the kind of life we all grew up with in the 20th century, but still very hard for people to cope with. And so there are endless cartoons from this time period showing an octopus of one kind or another taking over society. In this case, it's Standard Oil, and the arms are the subsidiaries of Standard Oil, uh, reaching out into all sorts of places to take control of even the railroads. See how the, the arms of the octopus have railroad tracks below where they're taking over? Because, of course, we all know that Standard Oil was big enough that they could no negotiate special rates on the railroads, even though the government tried to control the railroad rates. They, met, they told them what they could sell their product for on the railroads, um, rather than having a free market control that. Here's another octopus. This is a corporate octopus. And its arms are made up of the various railroads. Railroads were our biggest corporations and our biggest source of wealth in this country at that time. And finally, here's a cover from Harper's Magazine from 1901. He doesn't need eyes with us to guide him. So we have the captains of industry on the back of labor showing labor what to do. That's, that's the climate of the period uh, with regard to corporations and capitalism. And, and then finally, here's this great cartoon showing a, a knight, sort of a transformer, I guess, a knight and a train combined uh, that's named Monopoly. And the, the only people who can ride on it are the capitalists. And they're bearing down on this poor laborer who has basically only a club which is named Strike, and he's on a horse called Poverty, and the wires in the background are named after Western Union Telegraph Company, Wall Street, and the New York Railroad, New York Central Railroad. This is the kind of stuff that's in the media every day at the time Henry Flagler and others were trying to take on projects like um, Florida East Coast Railway or building corporations. So we know these people, right? This is Andrew Carnegie and Henry Clay Frick, by the way, Henry Clay Frick so much admired Henry Flagler, he kept a framed photograph of him in his office in New York. He was a big admirer of Henry Flagler's. Um, they were presented with one of the first big strikes, and we all know about it, we all learned about it in school. It's called the Homestead Strike, right? And uh, this, the laborers struck for higher pay. Uh, the Homestead plant, or mill, I should say, the Homestead mill had uh, made some adjustments to its machinery so that they were going to realize much greater efficiency. And according to Andrew, Byer, Andrew Carnegie and his biography, this, the workers were offered a 30% pay increase, but they wanted 60. And Andrew Carnegie and Henry Clay Frick said, Frick said mm, I don't think we can do 60. There's not a 60% improvement in efficiency, and it doesn't make sense to make a one-time leap by 60% in wages. So they decided to resist. In fact, to them, this is a Mutt and Jeff cartoon, by the way. This is what the folk, this is what the communications from the labor union sounded like. Yeah, we want 75% of the profits, a three-hour work day, and a five-day work week. By the way, standard work week back then was six days. By the way, back at this time, if you were a part of the ready-to-wear market that was growing up in Manhattan, your average work week was 100 hours. If you worked for Andrew Carnegie in the steel, the steel mills, your, hour, your average work week was about uh, 70 hours. If you worked, if you were lucky enough to work for George Westinghouse, your average work week was 55 hours. How many people work 55 hours a week now? Not many. Very different labor environment in those days as well. Um, so the workers went on strike at Homestead. And up in the upper picture, there's a picture looking up from the river up toward the Homestead plant. You can see they built a fence. Part of what Andrew Carnegie and Henry Clay Frick decided to do was build a fence around their capital investment to protect it. So that at least during the strike, it wouldn't be destroyed. And they could go on when the strike was over. Then they decided they better get some Pinkertons in, the largest sort of detective and protection agency at the time, to protect their investment more than just the fence. And the Pinkertons decided they should come in by river so that they wouldn't inflame the labor, the strikers, by marching through town. So they, and they would come at night so that they would further not inflame the workers. So, they floated down the river in this boat that you see pictured in the drawing here. But the laborers, of course, had found out about it and were waiting at the bridge to bombard them with bombs and, and rifle shots. So that by the time they got to shore by the plant, this is the battle you're seeing, the laborers had just lined up and started 
uh, shoot at them like they were sitting ducks. When they finally let them off the boat, and you can sort of see a, a, a line here where you can walk up through the crowd of strikers, they beat the Pinkertons as they walked up the line. Um, that's not how I learned in school. How I learned it was Frick and Carnegie were really bad guys and really beat up on labor. But in fact, the facts are that the laborers beat up the Pinkertons very badly in this. And they had to send the federal troops, and that's a picture in the lower corner, right hand corner. The federal troops had to come in to restore order there. So that's the kind of thing Flag, Flagger watched play out through the media and heard from his colleagues about, and the kind of thing he had to keep in mind if he was going to employ and continue to employ a major labor force. In 18, um, that was in 1882, I'm sorry, 92, and 93, the next year, George Pullman, who Flagler knew well because he sent his cars off regularly to Pullman, and that, that, was the, that was the most luxurious form of travel in the day, and you were constantly upgrading your rail cars back then. They changed the trucks, they changed the brake systems, they changed the suspension systems, on and on and on regularly. George Pullman had built a little model town outside Chicago called Pullman, um, Illinois, with row houses and a theater and a hotel and a restaurant and all kinds of things. He thought it was great, and the, the laborers thought it was great too until the panic began to set in 1893. And then he decided he had to cut wages to make his business work. And he stupidly did not cut the rent on the roadhouses, which upset the railroad road workers, or the Pullman car workers, to the point where they <clears throat> became very agitated. So enter Eugene Debs, who was the industrial workers of the world's uh, head, and was a socialist. They called themselves the Wobblies. Um, and, um, he starts the fan of flames, and then Samuel Gomper shows up, head of the AFL, who spoke to a crowd of 25,000 workers. No PA system. Can you imagine trying to speak to 25,000 people without a PA system? You wonder how that works. And before you knew it, there was a riot. Well, you also know what happened in 1893. There was the World's Columbian Exposition, probably the third most important event in American history, but mostly forgotten today. This is a picture of the Grand Basin, or the Court of Honor of the Columbian Exposition, that figure, in, that tall figure is the Republic, uh, sculpted by Daniel Chester French, who did Lincoln and the Lincoln Memorial, for example. She looks at a lot of black and white photographs because she was covered with gold leaf, so she really glistened in the sun, and she was uh, a, a symbol of what we thought America was becoming. Well, after the riots were finished, uh, at the end of the exhibition, this, this is when this uh, riot, this uh, strike broke out, after the riots were finished, this is what the the White City or the Columbian Exhibition looked like. It was destroyed in a skirmish with federal troops, uh, set a fire, and uh, that was the end of the White City. It did start the City Beautiful movement, and we do have a city laid out by one of Olmsted's sons here in our county. Uh, it's now called uh, Lake Park, but it was called Kelsey City, and it's a, it's a direct result of the City Beautiful movement. And if you drive up 95, you can see an exit called um, Midway, right? Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, you can see an exit for the White City. There is a town named the White City after the Columbian Exposition, and its main drag is called Midway because there was a Midway in the Columbian Exposition. It has been in every fair, big or small sense. Uh, and this all came to a head for those watching this and those invested on either side. In 1910, when the Los Angeles Times building was bombed, killing 26 people and destroying the building. Um, and that's when one of America's most amazing characters ended the scene. This is William Burns. Um, he had been just been involved in San Francisco breaking the graft of the Southern Pacific Railroad. Southern Pacific Railroad had a real firm grip on American politics, uh, California politics at the time. And, Adolph Spre and there was all kinds of graft throughout San Francisco. So Adolph Spreckles hired William J. Burns, America's greatest detective, to come in and figure out who was guilty get the evidence, get them on trial, get them put behind bars. And by the way, Hearst, this went on for a long time, went on for a couple of years. And so the newspapers got tired and started to lampoon all the investigators and created a new um, comic strip, strip called Mutt Jeff. So Mutt Jeff was created as a result of this graft investigation in San Francisco, and it was filled with interesting characters. So Burns, who had, by the way, bright red hair, bright red mustache, was caricaturized in the comic strip as Hot Tabasco Burns. And one of the characters named Beanie always wore a little beanie cap. And some of us are old enough to remember when college kids always wore beanie caps. That comes from the Mutt and Jeff cartoons that came from this famous case. So 
The City Fathers of Los Angeles decided to hire Burns because he was America's greatest detective. He figured it out, and sure enough, he did. Uh, in relatively short order, he was able to gather irrefutable evidence, an uh, airtight case against John and James McNamara. And what's interesting about this is that John McNamara was the head of the Steelworkers Union based in Indiana. They got him red-handed in his office with a safe full of all the stuff, bomb materials at his home, all the stuff they needed to convict him. And they did convict, well, he had ahead of himself, but they brought in the labor unions, Gompers and Debs and those uh, folks brought in Clarence Darrow, the great defender, who, was who ended up being indicted on two charges, jury tampering, and had to leave California because of this case and promised never to practice law in California again. Never learned that in my history classes either. Um, here's Eugene Debs, uh, again, head of the Wobblies, and a socialist, so he was part of this whole cry that these guys are being set up, they're being framed, and Samuel Gompers, who, when he found out they were truly guilty, said, oh my gosh, I've been, I've been taken to the cleaners, I've been fooled. And of course, Lincoln Stephens is on the scene because he was one of the greatest muckrakers of the time, a writer who had supported uh, Burns when Burns was going after Southern Pacific, but who hated Burns um, when he uh, found that the McNamara brothers were guilty. In fact, Je uh, Lincoln Stephens said that the bombing was justifiable. So that's how far apart the two sides were. Turns out, the McNamara brothers had planned and executed 110 bombings between 1906 in 1910. That's a lot of bombings. And they weren't the only ones out there bombing things, by the way. So another example, I hope, driving home the message that this was a very different society when Flagler was doing his work here in Florida. By the way, Burns doesn't get enough credit anymore. He is hardly remembered by anybody. Anybody remember him? No, he was great friends with an author, uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote, you know, who, right, who's very popular now. Um, but, and he, so, and a model for a lot of that as well. But um, later in his career, he went on on his own. He was part of the Secret Service early on. Uh, Secret Service was involved in forming something called the Bureau of Investigation, which was later called the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And one of its earliest directors was William Burns. And who was his assistant? J. Edgar Hoover. So when you see the movie and, and you see J. Edgar, J. Edgar Hoover getting credit for bringing fingerprinting to the FBI, it's not true. It was William Burns who brought it to the FBI. J. Edgar Hoover carried on uh, that mission of using fingerprints as a, a, a important source of identification. So when you think of the FBI, think of William Burns, please. Um, you won't find anything about William Burns on the FBI website or on the Wikipedia entry or whatever for the FBI history. He's basically been forgotten, but he shouldn't be. He was America's greatest detective, bar none. Uh, he left the FBI in a couple of years because he ended up having to testify against the former Attorney General for the United States. Even Washington at this time was incredibly corrupt. We should be a little more forgiving of these countries who are just, uh, just getting started with their democracies and we think, boy, they should have it down. Well, we didn't have it down. It took us a long time to get to the point where we are now and it's still, as you know, all know, we all know, it's not perfect. So Henry Flagler was exposed to some of this because <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt said to the Attorney General, you know what, I'm sure Henry Flagler's up to no good down there in Florida, so we're going to prosecute him for peonage, for slavery. And they brought a peonage suit against Henry Flagler in 1908. It was dismissed by the courts pretty quickly. But he still had to defend himself. He said he spent a lot of time and energy to just preparing the defense. I wanted to put up this handbill because it's so really rare. This is probably the only one that survived from the building of the Overseas Railroad. But of course, Flagler, to get 4,000 workers to do this work had to work through um, employment agencies to go out and find workers for them. But they put up these handbills not because they thought a dollar fifty sounded like not very much, but because it sounded like a lot in the 1900s, 1908, 1907, 1906. And to give you a sense of it, you know what William William Burns worked at, made as a Secret Service service agent at the same time, three dollars a day. So highly trained. And by the way, Secret Service was created to, finally to protect presidents initially after the McKinley assassination. We didn't do it until the McKinley assassination. The president still let people in the White House, they walked up, rang the doorbell, walked in, and they walked down the streets on their own at night, and they didn't have any protection. So a highly paid ser Secret Service agent made $3 an hour. Flagler was offering, a, a, not an hour a day, Flagler was offering $1.50 a day to come work on the, the Overseas Railroad. So by the time 
the big day comes. And we all know, I hope, know about the story of building the Oversea Railroad, how many years it took, hurricanes blew it down in the meantime, how many 4,000 workers at, at times to build this incredible thing, concrete, all the engineering aspects of it I think are well known and have been talked about many times and are been covered in many books. But So I haven't made that focus of this talk. But I wanted to give you a sense of the labor movement at this time, the labor environment, because when Henry Blacker was ready to go to Key West in January of 1912 to celebrate the completion of the Oversea Railroad, they hadn't quite made his birthday, which was January 2nd. They were hoping to get there by his 82nd birthday, and they just couldn't quite make it. But when he went on January 22nd, he wasn't sure what the reception might be like. He wasn't sure that the tracks might not be bombed. He wasn't sure that there might not be sabotage along the way, because that was the environment at the time. He thought he'd been good to his employees. He thought he treated everyone fairly. Uh, he worried about such things. We know that from his correspondence. But he couldn't be sure. So this is engine number 12, an old standby as part of the Florida East Coast Railway, that made its way down ahead of him as a pilot train in case there was sabotage or bombing. Fortunately, 12 arrived with its two cars, a baggage car and a passenger car, with no problems at all. And Flagler's private train was close behind. This is how we remember that whole trip, of course. We don't remember the pilot train, we don't remember all the worrying because we weren't exposed to those things, but Flagler certainly thought about them. And so Flagler arrived with his train and his two private cars being pulled by engine number 48 into Key West on January 22nd, 1912, to tens of thousands of people waiting to greet him. And boy, was Key West happy. They've been talking about this at that point for 80 years. They were happy to see it finally happen. They were sure that this was the, the future uh, and their prosperity was going to hang on this event. Flagler was getting hard of hearing and hard of eyesight at this point. He, dis, he disembarks from his rail car. It goes out to meet the, the, the dignitaries there who uh, are there to wait, waiting there to meet him. And you can see, see the plaque in the upper left-hand corner. That's a pair of silver medallions made uh, by Tiffany and Company, commissioned by the citizens, the grateful citizens of Key West. They wanted him to know how grateful they were, so they commissioned these beautiful large medallions to give to him as a present. In fact, those medallions are part of the museum's collection, and you can see them in the museum's history room today. And they're really special. And by the way, back then you could order from Tiffany in November and have it in January, no problem. It doesn't work that way today. In fact, they rarely do special commissions today. So, this is where we sort of, we just rejoin the story we all know now. And the grateful workers that he worried might not be so grateful turned out were grateful. They took up money. They had a subscription that they limited to, I think they ended up limiting it to a dollar. They had so many employees who wanted to give, toward a gift to Henry Flagler, they said, look, you know what, we've got more than we need, so we're not going to take more than a dollar from any one of you. Which was still a lot of money if you're making a dollar fifty a day, right? But they had workers who wanted to get five and more dollars uh, toward this. And the gift the grateful workers gave to Henry Flagler that day was this beautiful gold telegram box made by Tiffany and Company. And inside was a copy of the telegram of congratulations they'd sent to him on paper, but it's copied on a sheet, a fairly thick sheet of 18 karat gold. So you can imagine how overwhelmed he was to, to have accomplished the ultimate uh, extension of his railroad, to be greeted by the citizens who were so grateful, to be greeted by employees who were so grateful, to be given these wonderful gifts. And by the way, I should mention that his rail car still survives. It's at the museum in the Flagler Keenan Pavilion, rail car 91. And as he walked by, he, he said, I can't see the children singing who were waving flags and singing special songs they prepared for him, but I can hear them, even though he was hard of hearing. And he was most grateful. And for a week, the celebrations went on in Key West, marching bands. Of course, it was a big Navy outpost at that time. Um, that's the story we know. It had a happy ending. But it, in Flagler's mind, that wasn't necessarily how it was going to end. He had all of these things to overcome, the economy, the labor, a president who was out to get him and the other capitalists. And he somehow survived all of that, accomplished this goal, not to mention all the engineering uh, that went into this amazing feat. The most ambitious engineering feat ever accomplished by a private citizen was accomplished by Henry Flagler. 1912. 
And we celebrated the completion of the Panama Canal, which was completed in 1914. It was an excuse for another World's Fair, this time in San Francisco. So our story has a happy ending, but I, my point in the lecture today was to help bring all of, take all of us back in time to get some sense of how, the, how, how Henry Flagler had to view the world, what kinds of things he had to consider when taking on this project. Not just the engineering, that might have been the minor part of it, I think, in fact. He, 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 was said, he said in the interview, well, when they said, how do you, how do you build a railroad like this? He said, it's easy, you just build one arch after another. You know, in some ways, I think for, for him, this was, the engineering part was one of the smaller concerns with everything else that was going on in the world at the time. So that concludes my lecture. I'm happy, thank you for your patience and your attentiveness. I'm happy to try to answer any questions you might have. You mentioned that the French started, well actually it was the Spanish that started the Panama Canal and then the French. Well they didn't actually dig anything. I know the Spanish were just talking about we it, talking mapping about it out, trying to figure out. You said it all has to start somewhere. Right. So they did the talking and then the French started the digging. Uh, Ferdinand de Lesseps. Yes. What was his role in the Panama Canal? Well, I think he set up the corporation that that set, collected the money and contracted with people like uh, 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 Eiffel to design the, the, the lock gates and things like that. So they, I mean, Eiffel did that on spec. I don't think he ever got paid for it, but he was contracted to do it. He earned his reputation in the canal. Uh, the last, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. The French had done the, the Red Sea Canal and, and thought that this canal would be like the same, moving a lot of sand out of the way, but it turned out to be a whole lot different. A mistake that Teddy Roosevelt, by the way, made after he left the presidency. He'd taken a little tour of Africa, and sort of like the French building the canal in Africa, he thought, well, that was a lot of fun, and he got to tour the world afterward, and he fed it everywhere he went, and treated it like he was still president. So he said, well, I'll go down to South America and do the same thing. There's an arm of the Amazon that hasn't been mapped. I'll just go hike to the headwaters and come down. Well, it was like getting off the boat in Florida, hiking to the headwaters of the Mississippi, and coming down the Mississippi only in a very hostile environment. And Teddy Roosevelt almost didn't survive. He barely survived the trip. It weakened him so badly that, in fact, it contributed to his relatively early death. And it's a great story documented in a book called River of Doubt. So if you're interested in that story, I would highly recommend that book. Other questions? Yes? How long did Flagler stay in Key West during the uh, celebrations? That's a really great, great question. Knowing, <coughs> knowing his condition and knowing, uh, I don't know the answer for sure. I'd have to go back and dig through their archives a little bit more, but I don't think he stayed the whole week. I just don't, that wasn't his pattern by that time in his life. Did he stay in a hotel, or uh, did he stay on his uh, private car? So, that's another great question. I suspect he stayed on his private car. He brought two cars, Rail Car 91, which he named the Alicia, and his own privately but on loan to a railroad museum in Indiana. Um, a little more elegant than Rail Car 91, but both uh, traveled with domestic staff and both had what were considered very luxurious accommodations for the day. So I think staying on his car would probably make the most sense. Who was Alicia? Alicia, it was named, he named Railcar 90 Alicia and his yacht that he had registered with the New York Yacht Club, Alicia, both named after his uh, second wife, Alice Shorts. Question back there. You spoke about Flagler's interest in Cuba. Can you speak a little bit about what his interests were for the Bahamas? Well, he built a hotel in the Bahamas in Nassau. And he ran the P&O line over there. In fact, the P&O line departed from the breakers. There was a steel pier directly off the breakers where you could board a P&O line ship and go off to, to what was called the Colonial in Nassau, the Bahamas. And one of his novelettes I mentioned earlier was written for the Colonial. And the Colonial has been reopened, though. It, and it operates as a hotel now, though. You, you really can't see much of the historic fabric of that building anymore. Yes? Uh, just the... Uh Obviously, the hurricane did a lot of damage to it. It seems like you'd be set by, by that. Why was it possible? What, just couldn't make it well, I'm glad you asked. Was the, why was the Overseas Railroad profitable? It wasn't. Um, you know, railroads are profitable when they can carry a lot of freight, not so much passenger traffic. And while it was popular as a passenger train, it wasn't 
wasn't popular as a freight train. Uh, for one thing, those coaling stations, like the one I showed you a picture of, became obsolete within a few years because the Navy was the first Navy in the world to switch over to oil-fired ships instead of coal-fired ships, and they could go a lot further on their tank of oil than they could in a bin of coal. So they could pass Key West right up after they came out of the canal, and they did. So um, what's that? No profit anymore. There just wasn't any profit. It was, uh, it was down on its heels. So when the hurricane struck in 1935 and wiped out the tracks, they could have easily rebuilt the Fort East Coast, East Coast Railway, or the Overseas Railroad, because the bridges were intact. They're still intact. You can see them when you drive down the Key West. They're in great shape. But um, there were two reasons. One, it had never been profitable, so why rebuild it? And two, the automobile was becoming so popular, why not try to somehow turn it into a roadbed, which it was until 1981 when the government, the federal government, stepped in and built the Overseas Highway. So it was really seven decades before the federal government, with all of its resources, would dare to take on something Henry Flagler did with his own money and his own ambition 70 years before. There was a question earlier. Well, I guess I was wondering why the port didn't take off. Yeah, he also, he also had trouble getting the Navy uh, fought him and getting the dredging, <laughs> dredging permits he really thought would help make the port more successful as well. So that, that contributed to the problem as well. Speaking of dredging, um, I was told, and maybe I'm incorrect, that Peanut Island, that the, um, uh, the passageway that was created there, the cut? Yeah. Yeah, was actually Henry Flagler's conception. I don't think and so. He didn't live to see it. He died in, what, 1914? And then that deposited and created um, Peanut Island. I, I don't think that can be true because no. the lake would break through up by Munion Island when it did occasionally break through during winter storms. Um, that probably would have been a more likely place to put the cut, but the, the Army Corps of Engineers put that cut in in 1918. And while we talk about the island of Palm Beach, it's not a term Henry Flagler would ever have recognized because it's only an island by virtue of the work of the, engine, the Army Corps of Engineers. When they cut the Boyne Inlet in 1926, it, was techn it technically became an island at that point. In fact, before that cut was put in, another reason he would have cut, put the cut in there is that Palm Beach extended northward quite a way before that cut was put in. And for a while, the other side of the cut still belonged in the town of Palm Beach, so town limits. Yeah, and, and well, Paris Singer proposed an aerial tram. He wanted tram cars on wires to run over the inlet to get to the other side of Palm Beach. But eventually, the town of Palm Beach just abandoned that north part of the town. And, it's now what we call Singer Island, which isn't an island either, you know, but we like... Is Palm Beach really an island? That, it is technically an island now because of the two... A barrier, inlets. a great barrier reef or archipelago? Maybe the earliest geological history was a barrier reef, but in fact, by the time Henry Flagg arrived here, it was Lake Worth, and everybody, the pioneers lived around the shores of Lake Worth. It was their main mode of transportation. You didn't identify yourself as West Palm Beach or Palm Beach. You identified yourself as a Lake Worth area resident. You might live on the east side or the west side. You have to choose the east side because of pioneers living there when the Providencia grounded with its load of 20,000 coconuts. We're going to carry them to the other side of the lake next to already plant them. They eat, ate what they could plant at the rest on the east side of the lake and it looked a lot more lush by the time Flagler arrived than the west side. But he hoped the west side, which is the only city he laid out from the ground up and invested the most, the most of himself in, would one day be a city larger than Jacksonville. He had a lot of hopes invested in West Palm Beach and it was probably his greatest business of disappointment. He fully expected to spend eternity in West Palm Beach in the Woodlawn Cemetery. But in fact, a group of people called the Law and Order League sprung up at about that time and resisted him on everything he tried to do from about 1902 on. They just hated him. And he eventually changed his legal residence from Palm Beach County back to St. John's County and decided to be laid to rest in the mausoleum in St. Augustine as a consequence. Any other questions? No. What? Yes, I got one more maybe. No. Okay. I may be giving you a topic for another talk, but we know that the train ends and uh, the East Coast Railway ends with the final tracks being laid in Key West. Where did Henry Flagler begin laying tracks? Where does it start? Well, he bought up short runs of track up in uh, the Jacksonville, St. Augustine area and then standardized them. Does he tie into Georgia? The no, he didn't want to because his good friend Henry Walters had the Atlantic Railroad to, to, to took care of that part of the world. So, so he starts, just connected to it. Starts in Jacksonville and works out. Right. And by the way, Florida probably had one of the very first railroads in the country. It ran from Tallahassee to St. Mark's 
uh, and was running in 1838. It was, it was horse drawn though on rails to get cotton down to the port of St. Mark's, which is much an old, much older settlement than St. Augustine, but not continuously occupied. And that's it. I hope. Um, if you want to ask me questions personally, you, you're welcome to do so. We afterward we put out a few of the books that I've referred to along the way in the back in case you're interested in following up on any of these subjects. And I thank you again for coming this evening and for your attentiveness.